By the end of this video, you will have a working malware exe written in Python. It will silently run, steal browser cookies, and then close itself. All without the user knowing. All you need as a prerequisite is a Windows environment. But before we get started, given that this is malware we are making, it is of utmost importance that I stress that this is for educational purposes only. In order for us law-abiding citizens to understand how these people get us, we need to know how they do things so we can 1. protect ourselves, and 2. properly assess the damage. With that all out of the way, let's get started. All right, so I have my Windows 10 virtual machine here. No tools, nothing special added. I just installed Notepad++ as part of the setup. This is what we're going to be building here. Now, this is a lot of stuff. We're going to go ahead and break it down bit by bit. And we're going to assemble it from scratch. And in order to do that, we need to know exactly what we need. We need to put ourselves in the mind of the attacker to see what the plan is. All right, so first things first, what are we going to do? Well, given that a Python is an interpreted language, in other words, it is not compiled into machine code, it requires an interpreter that acts as a sort of, this is supposed to be a guy thinking. That's terrible. Imagine, imagine that this dude is thinking. This dude is thinking through each line and going, all right, what do I do next? This is different than machine code, which is basically as low as it gets, and it just does CPU instructions. In a way, this guy weighs a lot. He makes the file size pretty large. File size this large, it would definitely get spotted in something like Task Manager. There's a lot of overhead. That means it's probably a good idea if whatever this is doesn't run for very long. And for the sake of this video, our simulated malware is going to be something that just steals the browser cookies, so stuff like passwords, and then sends it over to a server of our choice. It does all of this when it's run for the first time, and in order to get some kid to run it or something, a lot of attackers just make it look like free Minecraft or Roblox or something like that. That's supposed to be a block. Oh my god. And the amount of time it takes to do stuff like this is less than a second, probably. So, we'll be fine. But given that it's something that somebody's supposed to run, we don't want this process lasting super long. For instance, we don't want this persisting on the computer actively in a startup folder or in the registry anywhere, because that would suggest very obviously that it's malware. So how do we go about doing this? My idea was to just write this teeny little script in Python, use PyInstaller to turn the script into an exe, so that people can run it without Python, and then change the icon of the exe with something like Resource Hacker. I'm gonna have to zoom in there. So you can change this to something like free Minecraft install. And there you go, you get the idea. Anyway, I just realized the program I'm using is VS Code. You're gonna to wanna to go ahead and get that and download it here. You're going to wanna to be running this on Windows because the program that we're gonna be using to turn this Python script into an exe requires that it's on Windows. Anyway, once you have VS Code installed, you're gonna to wanna to go down to this tab and look at Python, go here and just install it. I already have it installed, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip that. So what are we trying to do? First thing we wanna do is we wanna find the cookies. So we can get those sweet session tokens and an attacker would use these to steal accounts and do a lot of other stuff. But the cookies themselves are encrypted, so in order to get the juicy stuff, we need to decrypt them. And in order to do that, we need to find the key. So I'm going to go ahead and reverse these. And then after all that's said and done, we're going to go ahead and send them to a C2 server, which is going to be our machine. Anyway, for Google Chrome, the cookies are going to be stored in one of these folders here. Google, Chrome, user data, default, network, and cookies. Now, we don't even know what file type this is, since it's just a standard file. But if we just use Google, we can see that it's stored in a database file. And as you can see, it is a bunch of garbage. You can see a few things come in as plain text, but we're not making use of much of this. That's because that file is an SQLite 3 file. So we need a way to parse these before we send them over to our machine so that we have information that we can actually do stuff with. Anyway, now that we know that, we need a way to get that file. So we're going to go ahead and grab our first import that lets us look at file paths really easily. And we're going to go ahead and call this method from this path object that we just imported, which basically gets us to the app data folder, or sorry, the local app data folder, despite the username, since we can't know everybody's username before they run the program. This is a pretty easy step to go through that. I also forgot we need to import OS as well, and this should be good. So if we go ahead and print app data local, there we go. We get our file path. Anyway, this is nice and all, but we need to actually navigate to where the cookies are, one, and two, where the encryption key is. I already went over where the cookies were, but local state is where the cookies are. So I'm just going to go ahead and steal this line because I'm lazy. So a variable that is this, but with a bunch more stuff added on. This is the path to the local state file where the encryption key is. And then we have the path to the cookies file. 
Anyway, now we need to read these. First order of business is to get the key. How do we do that? Our next import is going to be the JSON library, which will let us more easily parse through large amounts of texts, which will let us more easily parse through large amounts of text. And now we have a with statement. Bear with me here. We're going to go ahead and open the file at this path, which we already specified with read mode. And we're going to encode the text in UTF-8. This is important. If you don't do this, everything will break. And we're going to import all of this as the variable F. What we're doing now is we're just going to load this. The file itself is in this variable right here. Anyway, you'll notice this says encrypted key, which is misleading because it's actually encoded. We just need to go ahead and decode that so we can get the key itself. First things first, we're going to go ahead and import base64, and then we're going to go ahead and use that library to decode the key using the base64 decode function, also using UTF-8 encoding. Now, if we go ahead and print encrypted key, we're going to see it, but we see dpappy right here. That's the data protection API prefix. We don't need that. That's not part of the key. Let's get rid of it. So all we're doing, we're just getting rid of the first five characters. And as you can see, that's not there anymore. Anyway, I just realized I lied earlier in the video. Not only is the key encrypted, but it was also encoded. We just decoded it. We're going to use the Win32 library. Now, it doesn't come pre-installed with Python, so we're going to have to get that ourselves. How do we do that? Well, they could just go to the terminal and do pip install pywin32. But if you don't have this little prefix here, you're going to be installing that in your global Python profile, and not necessarily stuff per project, which you're probably going to want. So in order to do that, you're going to want to set up a Python virtual environment. Pretty easy. All you do, type Python if you're on Windows, which you are, and... Venvi and the name of your environment, which is just going to be Envy. You could type in whatever you want here. It doesn't matter. Anyway, you'll notice after you hit enter, it's going to make a new folder right here. I already had this there before, but this is where all your dependencies and Python interpreter is going to get stored if you're using a different version of Python, for instance. But if you don't have this here, you're not in it yet. So you need to type this command. The name of your environment, which is Envy backslash scripts, and then activate dot bat. If dot bat doesn't work, just get rid of it and then do activate. Anyway, after you hit enter, you'll notice you'll have this if everything goes according to plan. And now we're going to go ahead and install our first external library. It's going to do pywin32. Next, we're going to go ahead and import win32 crypt. If I can spell, there you go. After we have that, we're going to go ahead and use the crypt unprotect data function on the key to get the key. So if we print the key here, this is the key that is going to be used to descramble the cookies file so we can see the session tokens. And this is a crucial step that an attacker would use to steal accounts and passwords and lock you out of your account. But next, we have to actually use this key. Let's get into that. Well, if you try to go to the cookies directly, and say you try to open them, you'll get this. Cookies are locked, while Chrome was open anyway. So how do we skirt around this? How about we make a copy of the file, and then read that instead? So we're going to go ahead and make a new directory, temp cookies. An attacker would definitely use a more important sounding name. But then in order to copy something to this directory, we need to have a new import, import shutil. And then you'll use the copy to method to copy the file at this path here instead. Also, I don't know if I said directory earlier, but this is not a directory. This is the name of the file. So if we run this, here we go, temp cookies. Notice how it's also the exact same size as the actual cookies file. Anyway, cookie files are weird because we're going to be using the SQLite 3 library and we're going to set up something called a cursor that will go into it and then get us what we need. To be honest, I don't know why it's done that way, but that's just the way it has to be done. So I'm going to make a new variable called con for connection. And I'm going to use the connect method, part of the SQLite 3 import, to connect to the temp cookies db variable, which is this file. But then I'm going to set up the cursor. Anyway, we're going to deploy this cursor with this command. Pause if you want to read. That gets the name, value, host key, path, when the cookie expires, some variable I don't know, I'll be honest with you. I just wanted to get it anyway. And a bunch more stuff. The one that we really want is right here. This is what we're going to be using the key that we got earlier to decrypt. So we've deployed the cursor and now it has this stuff. What now? We're going to go ahead and lump all the results into this variable right here, cookies data. Now for the fun part. We're going to go ahead and decrypt every single one of those individually. So for each cookie in this variable that we set just now, I should probably mention that this is also a list. So it's a bunch of cookies. So for each cookie in this variable that we just set, we're going to unpack all of these values from the cookie that it's currently going through. And we're going to make a placeholder variable that sets the decrypted value of the cookie to none right now. There's nothing in it. The reason we're doing this is because sometimes cookies aren't encrypted and they're just stored in plain text. We want to account for that and get everything. So if there's something in encrypted value without crashing the entire thing, you're going to try a string of text. If that string of text would throw an error, then it'll just break out of it and continue moving along without crashing the entire program. 
because that means we ran into a cookie that has its value stored in plain text. But what about the cookies that have their stuff encrypted? But first, before I show you this, we need to talk about how cookies are structured. First, we have the prefix that tells Chrome what encryption method to use. Next, we have what can be considered a salt that just makes sure that the operation can't be repeated. In other words, they can't change anything in the cookie without this not matching, and then the cookie is invalid. Then this is the actual stuff itself. But in reality, you need all of this. So going back to the code, so we're going to go ahead and save the salt, the nonce here. Going to get rid of the prefix. This is three bytes before, and then everything past this point, we're not including. And that leaves the nonce. That's what we're saving. Here are the actual goodies. We're just getting rid of everything before the 15th byte. And that happens to be the ciphertext in this case. Now, in order for this line to work, we need to do another pip installation. So in your virtual environment, which you can check with this, you're going to go ahead and type pip install pi crypto dome. X. Now you can go ahead and type this, and now this line should work. Anyway, think of that line as setting up the guy who's actually doing the encrypting, and you're giving him what he needs. The key, the encryption mode, and the salt from before, so that everything works. We're going to use our guy to decrypt the ciphertext, and then store that here. We're then going to decode this variable, and then store that here. If that doesn't work, we're just going to go ahead and store it in plain text and pass it along. Anyway, down to the else statement, we're just going to go ahead and set decrypted value to value. All of this would only run through anything in this space right here. And if there's not, that means this is the actual value we're looking for, and we store that. You know what I mean. The other way around. Anyway, we have one thing left to do before we package this all up and ship it back to base. That is, we got to convert the expiration date, because right now it's in milliseconds, to something that humans can actually read. That's pretty easy. All you got to do is import date time. We're going to make a new variable, and we're going to use the date time function from the date time module. We're going to have it start from the year 1601, because that is the starting year all the milliseconds are based on. That's just the number everybody decided arbitrarily. January 1st, 1601, plus the amount of milliseconds from that point. And that'll get us the date. Now, we're going to append all of these values into this variable from forever ago. Those being the name, the value of the decrypted value, very important, host key, the path of the cookie, expiration date, and lots more. Now that that's all done, we can close the connection to our database, and we can delete the file stored in 10 cookies database, so that our victim never knew that we were there in the first place. Of course, when I say victim, I mean the attacker's victim, because you would never use this for anything malicious. It's just for research purposes only, obviously. Anyway, now comes the fun part. We're going to send this over the internet to our machine. We're going to go ahead and import socket. Very last thing we're going to do, we're going to use a with statement to set up our internet connector as the S variable. We are going to connect to a designated IP and port number. If you have another virtual machine like I do, you're going to want to make sure that they're both connected on the same network, or at the very least they can see each other. So this would differ for an attacker because they would have to port forward a certain port if they were using a random port. I'm sure there are better ways to do this. That way the router knows to send all traffic going through that port to that machine. But for us researchers, all we need is the local IP and then a random port number that isn't being used by something else. For the port, I'm going to set it as 4444. And then for the IP address, I'm going to go to my Kali Linux and I'm going to see what my IP is directly. Looks like it is 56.4. So assuming that the Kali Linux machine is the brains of the operation, we're going to want this program to connect back to base. So I'm just going to go ahead and hard code this. Go ahead and wrap it in quotes to make it a string. So now this resolves nicely. Next, we're going to get all the decrypted cookies, save it to this new variable JSON data, and we're going to ship it off to base. So if we set up a netcat listener on port 4444, like we did in the program, and we go back here and we run it. Here we go. Now we have everything we need. And yeah, this goes without saying, don't use this on anybody. This script is probably jank anyway, and it needs some modification. But if you want to check it out, links in the description for research and educational purposes only. To be honest, I've had mixed results with doing this while Chrome is running. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But hey, if there are any modifications I can make, go ahead and let me know in the comments. I hope you guys enjoyed.